As you know, this session is organized by, by ECOLIS. ECOLIS is the European Network for Community-Led Initiatives on Climate Change and Sustainability. It's a meta-network, a member-based organization with 47 members in 19 European countries that works at different levels in catalyzing and enabling community-led uh, movements like permaculture, ecovillages, transition, and, and more. We work on research, on action, on policy, and basically enabling uh, networking among these, among these movements. We launched a program called Communities for Future that wants to, to, to enable this uh, networking and learning for a fair and regenerative uh, world. And as part of this Communities for Future program, we launched the Communities for Future sessions. And this is the eighth uh, session we have been hosting through 2021 and also the last part of 2020, all these, these, session, these sessions. And it's, it's a great pleasure to have, uh, to have you all here for this last session of, of this year. With this session, we want to explore what is CLLD, Community-Led Local Development and Smart Villages program. Also, we want to explore together how these programs can support the resourcing of our work, how can community-led movements can be resourced through these programs. Then we want also to share some concrete experiences connected to our network or part of our network that are already using those programs in practice that they are working with them. And also we want to launch uh, the CLLD working group or community of practice that started a few months ago uh, in its first steps, and we want to invite all those people that um, that want to engage actively on this topic to this group. But we will let you know more about this uh, later. Amelie Crook. Amelie Crook um, holds a bachelor degree in European Ethnology and Social Science uh, from the Humboldt University in Berlin, and um, she has been part of the Ecolisa Council. For, for some time, for two years. And she's currently studying a master's program in environmental governance. She has been part of uh, an intern on the policy team in Ecolis. And she was representing Ecolis in the, in the previous, no, in the previous, in the recent um, CLLD uh, conference happening just a few days ago. So, Amelie, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Juan. Thanks so much also for inviting me to do this introduction on this really, really important topic. And I'm going to dive right into it. Um, I think I don't have to explain a lot the reason of why we are we are here. We are facing a huge environmental and climate crisis, which we urgently have to address, want to address. And many of you are already addressing it. I'm, I'm sure about that. And now it's a question how can we improve our impact and how can we scale up the important work that we're already doing? I think it's really uh, important to note that scientists uh, have um, been really encouraging our approaches because they have provided the scientific evidence and insight uh, that the movement of community-led initiatives is very relevant as they have been demanding for exactly the changes that we have been implementing. The IPCC, um, the Global Assessment Report on Climate Change, has been suggesting to move from a growth-based economy to economy on uh, human well-being. And the IPBES, the Global Assessment Report on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, has also argued that we need to transform our economies, that we need to enable visions of a good quality of life that do not entail ever increasing material consumption, that we need to implement environmentally friendly technological and social innovations, and we need to reduce inequalities. And that's exactly what the movement of community-led initiatives has been doing over a long period of time. Community-led initiatives are collectives of individuals who are organizing at the local and regional scale to um, actively sustain, protect, and restore ecological and social qualities. And they 
are really um, important actors since they have managed to significantly reduce their ecological footprints. And therefore, it's the, really the question, how can we um, ensure that these solutions that already exist, that have been developed, can be scaled up and more people in a society can also be included and, and, and engage in this really um, important action that can help us to mitigate and to adapt to the planetary crisis. And that is exactly what we are aiming for with our Communities for Future program. And the leader and CLLD funding mechanism can help us to actually achieve our aims that we have been bringing forward through this Communities for Future program. So I, I will just shortly explain to you how our program is linked with this EU financial uh, and yeah, policy framework. Um, so the, the, the Communities for Future Action Program contains four domains. The first domain is the learn domain. In this domain, we are trying to address research and knowledge gaps on the full potential and the limitations of community-led initiatives. We see a huge opportunity in the scientific insight that uh, lies in uh, addressing the sustainability crisis through these movements and we are therefore um, providing a factual basis on community-led initiatives we are gathering application-oriented knowledge on how to actually set up such initiatives and also policy change oriented knowledge the second domain of community future is the inspiration domain in this domain we are facing the challenges of cultural values and ideologies that are really not helping to no, exactly. sustainability transformation so therefore we need to um, act on the potential of community-led initiatives as agents of cultural change who can bring about uh, the required shift in norms and behavior then the third domain is the enable domain and in this domain we are seeking to establish a framework for collaboration and capacity building to support communities to engage and uh, spread transformative action on the ground. So those are three domains. The fourth domain now linking it to the CLLD framework. Um, the challenges in this policy domain is um, that the political frameworks of the last decades has been very detrimental to the sustainability trajectory prioritizing scale, growth, and profit over sustainability. But there is also some really important uh, changes happening, both at the EU and the UN level. At the UN level, there are the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement, which are both aiming towards changing our society to be more just and be more ecologically friendly. And at the same time, there's also the Green Deal, quite new, uh, which establishes a policy framework to accelerate transformations across all sectors. And also interesting, it uh, considers relocalization as an essential element of, of this transformation. And now what do we do with these frameworks at the EU level? Well, we can actually make use of another really important uh, EU framework, which is the leader and CLLD framework. That is EU's main financial instrument uh, and innovative approach to local development. And it is therefore ideally placed to support bottom-up initiatives. Actually, the leader program is also quite focused at the, on the regional scale. So this is why we also want to make use uh, of the Smart Villages program, which is more focused on empowering community led initiatives at the very local scale. So our idea is to co collaborate between those frameworks. And now within the next uh, upcoming funding period in the EU, we always have these funding uh, periods that are happening over uh, a few years. And now in the, in the next framework, uh, this is going to be very important to finally align these uh, new policy that are being developed with these um, higher level policies of the Paris Agreement and the Green Deal. So that's what we want to do is we want to engage with 
this leader CLLD framework through um, engaging community-led initiatives into the structure of the local action groups, which are the main actors in this uh, leader CLLD program. And I'm sure Marion will elaborate on that a bit further. So that's basically our idea, getting engaged into the strategizing and the uh, implementation of the local action groups development plans, which are going to be um, developed starting now and and they will start to be implemented in 2023 so now we still have a, a good year to to get engaged and to bring our solutions into these programs and to scale up the potential of the community-led initiatives movement and that's what we're here for and i'm really looking forward to yeah seeing how this can be made possible thanks Marion is the current president of the European Leader Association for Rural Development. So who better than her to explain us what CLLD is? It's, it's an honor to have, to have her here. She was born and raised in Sweden. And um, well, she, she studied in the Humboldt University of Berlin, Geography and Environmental Management in 2002. And she went back to Sweden in 2009, uh, starting working with, with LAX. And uh, after founding the Leader Network of Sweden in 2013, then she started working as president in, uh, in the ELART organization. So Marion, over to you. She's gonna explain us a little bit, what is this about? Thank you, everybody. Uh, yes, uh, so my name is Marion Eckert, like, uh, Juan said, thank you for the introduction. And it's an honor for me to be invited, actually. Uh, it's very nice. Uh, uh, environmental issues is uh, very, very important for all of us right now, just like Amelie said. And um, to explain to you a little bit what a uh, leader is about, uh, the, the, all the leader groups, they work, they, they work with local action groups that are the bearers of the local strategy that they are working with. And uh, we have around Europe more than 3,300 local action groups uh, right now working with different, uh, different themes. And uh, from ELARD, European Leader Association for Rural Development, we gather more than 2,200 local action groups from 29 countries nowadays. Yeah, so it's a huge organization with a vast network. And I wanted to tell you, when our goal is to promote the leader method because we really believe in it. It's a bottom-up methodology. Um, I was told that many of you have never really heard about it. So I'm gonna take it very basically. And the ones who heard about it before, you have to just, you know, uh, lean back. Uh, so we are working with a method that it sounds very complicated. And when I meet the uh, project promoters here in Halland, I try not to talk so much about the seven principles because they make people really confused. Uh, what the main idea about leader is that it is uh, development, local development from local people for local people. That is the main point, I think, when I talk to people who never heard about it before. And be behind, behind this uh, whole system is a local action group. Those are uh, representatives that have been elected from uh from 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 the society kind of there are uh, representatives uh, from public sector from civil sector from private sector uh, and they are together forming a, a strategy that they want to about strengths and opportunities uh, that they want to develop in their area for a certain period of time that is defined from the european union yeah so each local action group has a local development strategy and uh, if you are active in a rural area chances are very big that there is a local action group close to you uh, and since all local development strategies are local <laughs> i cannot tell what is the main main objective of the strategy in the, your, the area where you are active that you have to you know 
see, okay, check for a leader or community-led local development in your language and check your area and then you will find the office even if you ask people at the municipalities and stuff, they will for sure know your leader office. And then you can, uh, and, and the role of the local action group office is often to kind of guide the local initiatives for, for their ideas, how it can fit into or not fit into their strategy. But one thing is sure, even if it is bottom up strategies, we are also integrated, uh, integrated in, uh, in, in the whole framework of development in which we act. So for example, my local action groups, we are very much aware of our municipalement, uh, municipality development strategies, of our regional development strategies, our national development strategies, and also then European level, which means that for all of us, uh, if it's not an outspoken goal with their own like funding pot, uh, then it is at least I can say a transversal theme in each strategy uh, is the environment because it's everywhere in all public strategies today, environment is really important. So, and then depending on uh, uh, can you do some community led uh, initiative for environmental actions, that depends on the strategy, uh, on the local development strategy uh, that you have in your area. So I really recommend you to contact the local action group office. They will are there to help you and they are there to, to guide you. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, so that is the main point. Uh, uh, also, we work with networking cooperation, and uh, and it's very big. We have, we that we in Elard we have uh, so many countries uh, that are present, and we are trying to keep up network uh, from most local action groups with other countries. So you can make also transnational projects if you have like. Uh, what do I know, an eco-village partner in one country and another country, then you could make a transnational cooperation project together, for example, if it fits in their strategies, so that you have to check out. Um, so that is the basic idea. Yeah, I don't know uh, what else is really important for people who have not yet found out about leader. I Because I take it you're mainly here because you want to find funding for your for your initiatives and I think many local action groups uh, also want to see how is your project um, uh, developed, uh, your project idea, is it something that comes from many actors together or is it just like one single person who had a bright idea and then there is no real anchorage with other people and you're trying to just find money to do something for your own idea, that is something you really need to, to show to the local action group that it is, okay, we are these people from maybe public sector, these people from the private sector, some businesses maybe, some public officials, and also maybe some NGO working together or just a group of people uh, working together to do uh, develop uh, uh, an idea and a vision. And uh, yeah, then I think you are in the right place at your local action group office. Normally, uh, you cannot do like the huge, huge project with your local action groups. Uh, I think I cannot say in European average, in my local action group, uh, the average uh, size of a project could be maybe 40, 50,000 euro for like one, two years that they want to do something about. But it is, uh, yeah, uh, if if you go above like uh, two hundred thousand, then you are probably in another project. I think uh, so. Uh, yeah, that's about it. And now we are gonna we're gonna jump into a few case studies, and um, let me. One moment here. Okay, so now I'm gonna pass the word to Antonia, Antonia Malak um, from Sudabineka village in Sweden. So Antonia became interested in climate and environment issues 10 years ago. She's from Germany, she has lived in, in Belgium, Poland, and um, she holds a master's degree in music from the Royal Conservatory in Brussels. Currently, 
She is the education coordinator at Southern Permaculture Eco Village in Sweden. So, Antonia, over to you. Yeah, hi. I'm very happy to be here and have this chance just to share a bit of Sudabin's experience with the CLLD funding. Um, we've been running, we're running now our sixth project with the funding, and we've uh, oh, in this our 15 years at all uh, in total. So I will share my screen. To show you this map. Um, so that's the map of Sudabin and uh, 14, 15 years ago when the property was bought, uh, it was just a flat field. So there was nothing on there, on there except for the barn and one house. And our biggest project with, that we run was for the landscaping. So as you can see, you see four, four ponds, two in the upper right corner and two in the down left corner. And you see these big seas that are horseshoes um, that we're using for the, for the permaculture garden. Um, and these, uh, well, the creation of these was funded with the CLD money. Um, so this was our pro biggest project to give an idea of the budget. Our smallest is around 3,000 euros and the biggest one was around 100,000 euros. So there's a lot of things possible. Um, also, this example that I gave you now um, is a very practical one, but we also have theoretical projects. So our current one is uh, analysis. Um, we have a biogas production and um, this biogas is making a digestase that we then can use for the plants. And we need to analyze this to see if it's safe and good to use. And therefore, we now also recently got funding. Um, so I extracted four learnings from our experiences that I wrote you down here. So the first one I already just said, it's very diverse um, possibilities. Um, so you can think very small or very big, and there's really a lot of possibilities. So as was said before, just check with your lag, your local action group, um, to see what, what is possible. Um, the second learning, be aware that there's a seven-year budget cycle. Why? Um, for the reason that at the beginning of the seven years, the pot will be really full. So the, the chance that you will get get funding for a big project is quite high or higher than at the end when maybe there's not so much money in the pot. But on the other hand, at the end, if there's the money in the pot of your like, they might have to spend it. So they might um, give you the possibility to exit this for, for small, quite, um, quite easy, fast projects. Um, this third learning, know the rules. Um, we've been having problems tries um, that we spent money and then couldn't get it back. The first time we wanted to save money. So what we did was um, buy food at the grocery store and cooking everything ourselves uh, instead of ordering catering. And then we learned that if we had bought catering, it would have been reimbursed, but this way we had to pay ourselves. And the other one, um, the other problem that we has, had when we were trying to organize an interlag that um, the rules of the different countries were just not compatible and it wasn't possible. And we found this out after putting a lot of time and work into it. Uh, and my fourth and last learning, uh, you need to have sufficient liquidity because you will have to spend the money before you actually get the funding. So you can't rely just on, on waiting and getting the money you, you will have to, to be able to pay yourself. Yeah. Baby is the um, former co-president of Ecolis. Uh, he has been part of the council of Ecolis for, for a long time. He is from Ireland. He's a community catalyst and co-founder of City for Cultivate Ireland and also part of the Cloud Jordan Eco Village. I could say much more things, but I think this is this is enough. So I, baby, I pass it over to you. You have Time. Thanks, Juan, and uh, hello, everyone. So my um, duty today is to give you a little case study of how we in Ireland have worked with leader companies, local development companies, to encourage or to um, make people aware 
of what they might use leader funding for. So I'm just going to run through a few slides to illustrate our projects uh, that we've been doing. The, the, what I'm going to focus on is communities for climate action. Um, I've availed of leader funding for many projects over the years, but in the last three years, I've been working with leader, paid by leader themselves to offer training to citizens. Um, the reason for this is because in Ireland, in the environmental earmark funding, uh, communities weren't drawing it down. And it's really highlighting the crisis of imagination that communities and citizens do not know what climate action is in our local areas. Uh, and so our objective, and I'm going to go through what we did, is offer a training. We call the Communities for Climate Action. We've held it with three local development companies in Ireland. That's um, Cavan, uh, local leader, uh, local development company, uh, Wexford and Kildare. Uh, these are all counties in Ireland. So we have we designed and delivered it as a consortium. It's got ESD training and our eco-village involved, as well as my own uh, co-op, Cultivate, uh, the Sustainable Ireland Co-op. Um, so what we did, it was a free course. Um, so we um, delivered it four times in three counties. Uh, because of the COVID restrictions, twice we had to deliver it uh, online, but it was blended. We had a virtual classroom uh, where we shared articles and encouraged participants to share uh, between the modules. And as I said, it was really um, helping uh, and informing community groups how what they might do, inspiring them with ideas from other places, sometimes in Ireland, sometimes across Europe, of what communities have done to draw down uh, funding for environmental projects. Now, I've spent 25 years telling people I'm not an environmentalist because I work in sustainability, which is, as, for me, what's more as important. Of course, we need a clean and healthy environment, but we need uh, stronger local economies and we need stronger communities. So when we see the Sustainable Development Goals as a framework to show sustainability uh, rather than uh, just seeing what's environmental. And I think there's something there that we might um, discuss a little bit more. So um, the, the course started with a very public launch and we used TV celebrities who are very well known to sort of make the people in that county, help people in that county see the relevance. Uh, these are um, TV celebrities that are very informed They do a TV show for the last 20 years. Uh, so people respect them and what they say. Um, we have a full day session called The Climate Adventure Begins. So we see this and frame it as a learning journey. And we spend a day doing exercises and uh, little presentations to give the context. And then we jump in with six sessions. These are held in the evenings. And as I said, twice we've held them virtually. So the sequence is, let's talk about climate change. Let's understand climate change. The second module goes into community resilience, looking at how in the climate and ecological emergency, what we might do. And it brings in uh, a cooperative approach, participative approach, community wealth building approach. We have a session on water and climate change where we partner with the local authority water officers who are mandated to work with communities to um, protect rivers and lakes and coastal areas. We have a session on zero waste in the circular economy. Uh, and in there, we bring in the sharing economy and other uh, ways that we can think about uh, our local areas and strategies to reduce waste. Um, we don't go too much into recycling, but definitely into strategies to uh, keep vital resources in closed loops. We have a session on energy, and it's focused around what we do as communities, community energy co-ops and transport. Again, what we might do with car clubs and community transport systems. And our final sessions on local food and sustainable land use, which we see a lot of opportunities. Uh, opportunities in uh, community supported agriculture, um, community orchards, uh, community gardens. Uh, there's so many uh, new initiatives emerging that bring food security, certain supply chains and strengthen the local economies. And we've managed to have a few farmers coming on the courses, which is quite good. What makes this um, free course unique and exciting to a lot of counties is they get a free site visit to Club Jordan Eco Village. So they come to the Eco Village for the day 
and we see a lot of projects that have got leader funding uh, or um, community-led projects that they may replicate in their community. We are really looking to mentor and have expressions of interest of projects that might avail of leader funding. So we, we mentor projects. We, we've got a very simple um, little sheet that people fill out, and then we link them with the local development company that then the animators will work with them to try and get their funding in place. As I said, we have a virtual hand, uh, classroom and other online resources and, of course, handbook. We, we've had to hold it twice virtually, which has actually been, I quite enjoy it, rather than traveling uh, up and down the country to, to host it virtually. Uh, but it's been good to have the face-to-face -face meetings as well. And the site visit to Club Jornica Village, where there's probably 15 different entities, cooperatives, companies, including a digital fabrication lab, a food hub, a community supported farm, sensory gardens, community gardens, community research gardens, allotments, a community amphitheater. So they get to see lots of projects that they might replicate in there. And we have sessions where they meet uh, experts in, in, in different areas. Um, and there's just some pictures to, to finish. We, we do a lot of outside work and using canvases and tools to sort of get participation, working in small groups and bringing experts from the outside. And so that's a, a little insight into something we've been doing in Ireland to really encourage community-led initiatives through the leader process and the community-led local development process. And we see a lot of opportunities to synergize with the new leader program, which will have a priority on climate change and sustainability. Uh, we're already seeing uh, a focus in Ireland on the sustainable development goals and linking things like tidy town contest to the sustainable development goals, which have been really useful. And with the new Green Deal, the smart villages, I think there's gonna be a lot more need to um, uh, spark that imagination of what a community-led initiative might be in our local communities that can be driven and led by our local communities. So I'll, I'll stop sharing there. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to make that presentation. And we're going to, to our last speaker, Fritz Bixler from Austria. Um, he's the mayor of Stanz in, in Styria, Austria. He has a background in forest ecology. And uh, the Stanz community is a, quite, it's a, it's a small commune that has been actively working, mobilizing community engagement in community energy initiatives. And um, I think the best one to speak about it is, is Fritz. So thank you so much for joining us. And uh, over to you. Thank you so much. You can unmute your microphone, please. If you just go down, well, perfect. There you go. Here we go. Okay, can you can you see the screen now? We can see it and we can hear you very well. Yes, okay. So uh, thank you very much to be your guest in your meeting. It's very a great honor to be. Uh, I'm the mayor of a, a small village in, in, in Styria, this is still part of Austria, and I will give you a rough summary of our transformation process, which we started in 2015. Um, uh, just a few slides where we are. This is uh, Austria, and we are on the southeastern part of the Alps between Vienna and Graz. And we have about 19 minutes to Vienna and 60 uh, minutes to our capital town and we have about 1850 uh, inhabitants so uh, the main question we started here is an overlook of our valley it's uh, very tiny and the, the most important thing is we had 83 percent of our um, uh, current these forests so, um, this is a picture from yesterday so we have pretty much snow now um, our main goal was um, when we started on 2015, um, how, how, what is the way to convince people to act in a climate friendly manner? Um, we have tried to separate in three different uh, processes. The first one is a technical innovation. 
uh, we spent a lot of time how to do all the technical stuff and we set up a, a research project where we try to get a plus energy district in a small community in Stanz uh, to do some uh, stuff to uh, use our own resources. We have a lot of biomass, as I mentioned before, 80% of our uh, uh, area is covered with forests. We have a lot of PV, we have uh, water and wind. And we try to um, get load shifts during the day and we want to cover sectors uh, between heat and, and electricity. So we have, uh, this project is running you know, three years. We are more or less in the middle of it. And we, try, we have uh, 7,750,000 7, euros uh, to get a lot of technical stuff uh, done. The uh, second one is uh, participation. The most important thing we think is to talk to each other. Uh, we, um, we believe that people suffer from all this expert knowledge. So they can't follow all that staccato of information they get every day. So uh, to talk to each other is a very important part of the solution, we think. And we have asked people what they want seven years ago. And there was more or less five uh, big areas. Uh, and I want to talk uh, about energy today uh, because energy was very important. Um, people want to, to, to create their own uh, energy in future. Two years ago, we joined the Smart Rule 21 initiative. Is, we were very glad to be part of this process because it gives us a lot of structure. Uh, we had to do some things and uh, we try to translate all the aims we have in this program uh, to all our people by uh, doing all these uh, communications. And one outcome was um, that we tried how to convince people because um, normally we have 5% of altruists. You know, they, they, they spend every money, they are uh, on every party, uh, regardless of what it costs. Then you have about 10 to 15% people who are convinced that we had to change something in our system. But 80% of our people say, what's about my pocket? I want to have this immediate economic advantage when I should change my, the way of life. So our problem is to convince this 80% of people because the first 20%, they are more or less uh, into this process. They are thinking about their future. Uh, they are talking, but 80% of people are are influenced about this, this theme, but uh, they, the main thing is they look to their to, to, to their pocket. Um, so the problem is how to convince to these people, how to get these people engaged in, in our process. And we we learned that uh, emotion is the only thing to transport information. So we try to do some methods to engage people uh, in an in a emotional way uh, to get uh, them um, ready to, to act. And uh, we have a sociologist in our group and I talked to him, how many people do we need when we have 1,850 inhabitants? How many people do we need to change something? And he said immediately 40. Um, so I learned they, they are thinking about in cohorts and not in, in number of people. It's a total different approach to, to, to get these emotions into the people and into the crowd. Um, and now we have about 80 people who, who are engaged in um, many projects which are, are on the way in, in our little village. And um, most of these projects are uh, self-driven. So we do not spend a lot of energy to move them because some of them uh, is, is a self uh, process which is uh, which is on the run. And um, one thing we, we do in, in, 
in energy business is in Austria, you can buy and sell energy between neighbors. It's very new in Austria and it's a more or less a revolution because um, 50 years um, energy comes from the energy supplier. So now we try to set up a local energy group. And one thing we want to do is uh, we want to try this, uh, this uh, energy token to get a transformation between kilowatt we produce, for example, this PV into euros. It's a, it's a technique which comes uh, out of the um, bank industries, but I think we are more or less the first one uh, community we try to, to, to establish this type of um, technique. And we are very glad that we get good support from the Smart World 21 group uh, to do this stuff because it's uh, very, very interesting to um, get uh, some sort of remuneration of volunteer work. If you have a, a coin, we, we know we, we, we say to it as Stanz coin, uh, we can do a lot of things uh, for um, remuneration because. Uh, otherwise, um, people can buy or sell energy, but sometimes there is not the right um, price or the right um, um, circumstances to sell it. Uh, when there is not the right price, they can move it to euros. You know, that's very important for our local local um, system because. In this way, they can go to the grocery shop and buy whatever they want for that stuff they earn from energy. So that's our, our way to, to, to give some input in our local um, uh, economic, economic. And we are very good supported in, in these terms by the, the Smart World 21 group. Um, The most important thing we, we learned in this uh, seven years is social innovation. All the technical stuff we will uh, give uh, some good solutions to the people. They can handle it. They can uh, they can uh, think about it. That's that's not the problem. The, the 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 big thing is how to do this social innovation because, uh, as I mentioned before, eighty percent eighty percent of people want to have economic advantage when they uh, move their um, their bodies so but what we learned is we do a, a combination between the homo economicus the homo ludens who tries to play with a lot of things and the homo reus uh, when you we try to get a good combination of these uh, three topics we we are convinced that we can uh, engage people to act in a, a gamer gamut friendly way so Thank you. I mean, there's a lot of questions there that are technical questions that will be for specifically for local lags. Each country may have slightly different rules. Um, I know that there's a lot of paperwork in Ireland. I don't know if it's the same for all lags. But there is a question that sticks out there that I think is worth asking out loud. I don't know the answer, which is how do smart villages and community led local development uh, relate to each other? I think that's an important question. Is it separate funding even? I don't know if Eamon or Marion or um, anyone knows that, but I mean, that's something I'm I interested could, in. I could maybe make a start. But I can, I, I would definitely welcome others' input because I think this is a, a question a lot of people are asking, maybe. So it's a very interesting question. And I mean, my understanding is that, well, firstly, there's no funding for the Smart Villages initiative. It, it's not a funded initiative. It's a, an approach that will need to be implemented through other funds. So the funds will need to come from elsewhere. And probably the most likely place is CLLD because the CLLD funding is targeted at the local level and you know can be applied at the sub-local level, which is the village level. So, I mean, the way I would see smart villages 
is very much, it's a kind of a, a methodology for really bringing the CLLD down to the sub-local, to this village local community level. Uh, and it's a, a methodology for promoting collective action. So mobilizing a community around a strategy at that sub-local level. Remembering that the LAG, the local action group, works at a, at a higher level, so at, a, at what we might call a local level. So Smart Villages brings it down to a smaller scale, if you like, to the community or village scale. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's a, an approach, a methodology, but it doesn't have funding in its own right. But it can be used by CLLD and by leader uh, and other CLLD groups. It's helpful, Iman. There's other questions there about um, does smart village include non-digital uh, social innovation? Because it's seen, uh, or it started out as really highlighting a digitalized approach. Yeah, well, maybe I can come on this again, and then I'd, I'd like to hear from others as well. But it, it started out very much like that, but it, it's much broader now. So now it also very strongly has the ecological sustainability dimension. Ecolise has one of been been one of the partners contributing to the framing of the Smart Villages initiatives, and this was something we brought in. So it's it's broader now, and it's about it's about working community development that's smarter, smarter in many different ways, smarter in how we respond to global challenges at the community level, mm -hmm. uh, including you know how we use uh, digital technology, but also how do we respond to the climate challenge. Yeah. So it embraces all of those things, and it's it, the idea is to be bottom up, so the, the local community decide what's the priority. Thank you, Davy and Eamon. We have a hand from Anna, Anna Parisan from E40. So over to you. Yeah, thank you. Actually, uh, I just wanted to add to what Eamon has said, Perfect. and um, yeah, he explained I think quite clearly uh, the connection in between smart villages and and the founds and, and the leader. Um, and actually I'm representing E40, uh, a company that is a leading company in Smart Fibra 21 and 27 projects. So uh, also including Stanz as, as uh, Fritz previously uh, presented uh, what they are doing now uh, and what we are trying to support as well. So I just wanted to say that uh, we also have some um, uh, do some research in each member state to see how they plan to support their smart villages uh, in the future, or or to find some uh, already existing good examples. And uh, what we see that in in many member states, so in each member state, it's a bit different. So each member state can decide how they would like to finance or from which fund they, they would like to finance the smart village approach. But in many uh, cases, it seemingly it will be the leader fund. And through the leader fund, they would like to finance the smart villages. So um, this was maybe not emphasized by Iman that this will be in many cases uh, a connection between the two. And uh, yeah, maybe that's it. Thank you, Anna. Marion, I think you want to... Yeah, yeah, I think everything has been said almost uh, uh, and written. And I think uh, the only thing to add is that smart village strategies uh, is an uh, indicator from the European level that uh, many um, uh, caps take over on national level. Um, for example, I think we will have it in Sweden as uh, one indicator that we can have in the local action group. Uh, the number of developed smart village strategies. Yes, yeah, so it's obligatory in the CAP uh, strategic plans in each member state. No. Uh, it's a result no. indicator. Uh, the no, number I don't think it's obligatory. Results. It's not obligatory. It's not obligatory. Uh, no, no. Result. If, it's, if it's a yeah. result indicator, it can be zero then. Yeah, yeah. Mm, but it's a mm. result indicator, the number of strategies. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, Kim. Over to you. Very, very short coming, uh, following uh, what Marion and Anna, Anna said. Uh, in Finland, we had just today a so-called morning leader cafe. And uh, in Finland, we are still uh, discussing where goes the limit of a normal village and a smart village, and what is the criteria of the innovation in there, um, how much of the uh, novelty 
or new things they should be to be able to present a smart village strategy or something kind of a new innovative thing to be considered as such if it's in a strategy but that was just uh, finish finish discussion in, in uh, uh, inside in, inside uh, our administration, but that proves just that it is not necessarily so easy. Thank you, Kim. We have time for a few more questions. So, who would like to go? I I think I I just want to add also that all these technical questions they are very different, and I I think if you're interested, uh, you should really take contact to your local action group in your area and in your country because it is different. Okay, so then an important advice is that it's different in each place. So the best thing is to contact the the national agency and the local action group close to you to your place, uh, David. <clears throat> yeah, if there's no funding in smart villages, which I had heard there was in maybe a year ago now, there was going to be 10 billion allocated there. So if there's no funding, I get the sense that it will be something else uh, local development companies will have to facilitate. Is there any funding then from the Green Deal, from the Climate Pact uh, coming down that potentially local communities can avail of for community climate actions? Does anyone know anything about that? Very, very good question. A lot of silence. So yeah. I don't think oh, is there question. anything coming down? Because I was reading larger questions uh, from Paulina. Just with, uh, <laughs> if there's nothing, no support or funding, additional funding for local communities with uh, smart villages, is there additional funding coming from the Green Deal or the Climate Pact? Or is there other supports or capital that communities might be able to access for local community climate actions? Okay, and I, and I see a hand from Elefterios. I don't know if it's in yeah, if a response may, for this. Yeah, uh, uh, contribute to that uh, question. I'm uh, coming from DG Regio. Uh, there is no legislative obligation, let's say, to the member states to use these funds for CLLD, but already in the draft partnership agreements, because the member states, they have also to already make their the link and to show how they coordinate their efforts and the funding that they get from the recovery fund or from the just transition fund, et cetera, we see that there are references that they will uh, uh, support CLLD and uh, local actions also with these funds. And uh, this is now also our effort in cohesion policy and regional policy where we try in the negotiation with the member states because of course the, C, the, 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 the smart villages approach can be also financed with the European Regional Development Fund. And we have also recitals after the negotiations with the parliament and the member states in our regulation uh, that uh, let's say uh, make the smart village concept uh, more visible for the member states. And we try to encourage them there not to put limitations on the local action groups of the funds that they would like to combine. Because we know from practice that there were member states that they wanted, let's say, to finance CLD only via Rural Development Fund or even EMFF, the Fisheries Fund. But we try to say, leave the local action groups since this, what we try to, 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 to support is the bottom-up approach. This uh, let's say, an uh, uh, initiative coming from the stakeholders on the ground, we should not dictate on them the mixture of funds that they would like to use, give them some room there. And of course, when it comes to, to the co-financing, of course, the co-financing in our case, it's linked to the development of uh, any uh, of, of a region. So in, in that sense, the more developed regions they get less co-financing uh, the intermediate regions a little bit more and the less developed they get more co-financing but even that is not a barrier a because for cld we say in our regulation that if you use money for cld then for you get 10 percent extra co-financing plus the co-financing we measure at the level of the member state so a member state can deviate and say for this particular action, 
or for this particular priority axis or for this particular program, I want to have even 100% co-financing. That means, of course, that somewhere else they will have to, to put uh, uh, less uh, co-financing. But it's possible if they want to support more CLLD local initiatives to say that here we want to give more support. This is possible from the regulation. Thank you, Lefterios. We have another hand for Amelie uh, and also thumb up from David. Um, I'm just aware of the time, even though the conversation is getting uh, to a very interesting point. Um, I was discussing uh, with, with Paulina and maybe what we can do is like, we, we close at, at the, uh, we close more or less on time, as we said at six, but for whoever wants to continue, we can let a uh, breakout room open and the conversation can continue also, okay? Because there are people that, that need to leave at six too. So, Amelie. Yeah, so I would just uh, ask a question that maybe can also lead into the breakout rooms, but also especially our next um, CLLD session and our working group is basically what do community-led initiatives uh, on climate change and sustainability need in order for them to be enabled to engage with this uh, CLLD uh, framework. So, um, and, and a question that is also in the mural is what opportunities exist for CLLD collaboration on the regional and national level, especially in education and training. And I think those questions are linked. How can we create a supportive uh, network in order to enable everyone who's interested to engage in the leader programming? Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Amelie. I think these, these thoughts link very well with the closing of this session. And um, we would like to, to ask to people know more about these programs you can share in the chat, you have already uh, started doing it, some of the um, resources, links, places where people can, can, um, can go for, for more information. So it would be very good if you can uh, help everyone that is interested in understand how can, can they find more information. So I invite you to, to put uh, that information in the chat. And, um, and we will be harvesting all this information that will be shared with everyone. And then what else uh, we want to do in this, in this closing? So uh, on the one hand, we want to invite you to a working group, to a community of practice. That's a, a group that wants to, it has already started in the last months and, and the design of the session came from, from that group. Um, is a group that is engaged with uh, the CLD and the Smart Villages program and wants to see how this can get linked to the community um, sustainability and resilience, uh, climate resilience work that we do in, 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 in Nepalese. So if you are interested in engaging actively in this group, not just to get informed, but to, to, to be active in, in the work we do. So please, you can write in, in the chat in private to Paulina and she will be harvesting your email, okay? Also, when we will send the information, if you, if you don't know yet, don't worry because you will be able to, to, to write to us at that moment and, and you, you will be able to join um, later. But that's one of the things we want to propose as an next step, okay? If you, if you want to engage actively. Then another thing is that um, we uh, are planning another session uh, but this one was mainly targeted to community-led initiatives, people that doesn't know much about, about these programs. And the next session, as we started to discuss in, in our community of practice, is mostly targeted for people that is already part of uh, local action groups, okay? People that, uh, that are already uh, part of the leader program and the CLG program. And we want to bridge this session with the next one. So, you will receive the information about it. So please, um, you're, you are invited to join. And um, we want to invite you to, to join. I think Paulina can, can put some of the links on the chat too. We want to invite you to join the Communities Future uh, program in general. 
by subscribing to our website, uh, to our newsletter, and uh, like this, you will receive all the information of our uh, different um, different activities. So I think this is uh, this is the summary of the next steps. And I see uh, the chat is very active. You're putting information there. So um, I don't know if I'm missing something, Paulina or anyone else, Amelie or or Amon, something that we should say before we close. No, I think you've summed it up very well, Juan. And I, I think the important point is that there's ongoing opportunities for everybody to engage in this further. Yeah. Through the working group, I think the community of practice, you know, is will be more active, but also through the follow-up sessions, particularly the session in, in February. But there will be more coming after that as well. That's it. Good job. You, you you can see well and Paulina wrote in the chat. Okay. You can read there. So you can see that we are doing something very, very interesting because we are breaching uh, we are breaching different worlds and trying to find a way they can collaborate. So I think this is a very, very interesting experiment. So thank you for having been part of this session and for joining the previous the next session and the, the community of practice. So I think that's it. We can thank you to the to the presenters and to everyone that made this possible. I invite you to turn on your microphone and you can use both the chat and your microphone to say thank you to everyone and say goodbye. Thanks everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Merry Christmas.